So if you take this pulmonology quick revision, the first important topic is the very important emergency in the pulmonology that is the ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. So in ARDS, what is a very, very important point is that is non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. That means your pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be absolutely normal. And pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, you measure with the help of Swan-Gans catheter. Right? You measure with the help of Swan-Gans catheter. And what is the most common cause of ARDS? The most common cause of ARDS overall will be the sepsis. And most common cause of direct lung injury causing ARDS, that will be pneumonia. Whereas, most common cause of indirect lung injury causing ARDS, that will be sepsis again. That will be sepsis again. Okay, right. Now, you see this question. Normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure with pulmonary edema is seen in. Now, you should know among this, the one which may be causing ARDS. So, left atrial myxoma, high altitude, pulmonary venous obstruction, pulmonary arterial obstruction. The one which can cause ARDS in this patient is high altitude. And in these patients, you will have normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure with pulmonary edema. So, the difference between non-cardiogenic and cardiogenic is that the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. So, here it will be normal and here it will be elevated. And how much is the normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure? That is around 6 to 12 millimeters of mercury. And we measure that with the help of the uh, swan gans catheter and in these patients in both of them you have the fluid which is present within the lung and where there can be the crepes and what is the criteria for describing the ARDS is the Berlin's criteria so you can just remember this mnemonic ARDS itself the word A stands for the onset of symptoms which is acute acute in onset that is the symptoms developed within one week of the clinical insult the symptoms develop within one week of the clinical insult. The word R stands for reduced PaO2 by FiO2. And how much will be that? Less than 200. And D stands for right diffuse bilateral opacities on the chest x-ray. So how will be the chest x-ray? You will have a complete white out lung. So that is what is your diffuse bilateral opacities on the chest x-ray. And the word S stands for the Swan-Gans catheter showing the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of less than 18. So even though we the normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is around 6 to 12, but the cutoff what we take is the 18 millimeters of mercury. And depending upon your PaO2 by FiO2 value, we assess the CVRT of the ARDS. So you take in mild, the PaO2 by FiO2 will be around 200 to 300. Whereas in moderate, the PaO2 by FiO2 will be 100 to 200. Whereas in severe, the PaO2 by FiO2 will be less than 100 millimeters of mercury. So that is how you will assess the CVRT of the ARDS. And this will be the chest X-ray in patients with ARDS where you have diffuse bilateral opacities, which we describe this as complete white out lung. Now, these are some of the important points in ARDS. Most common cause of ARDS is sepsis. They will have normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. The type of edema will be non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And this edema contain high protein content, right? And there is intrapulmonary shunting. That is from pulmonary capillaries, the shunt will be there into the alveoli. That we call as the intrapulmonary shunting. PaO2 by FiO2 will be less than 200. The chest X-ray will show you bilateral white out lung. And the treatment of choice will be the mechanical ventilator or low volume ventilation using continuous positive airway pressure. Okay. So, and this mechanical ventilatory settings are very, very important you require to give the low tidal volume and how much will be the tidal volume that is around 6 ml per kg and you require to give an adequate peep that is positive end expiratory pressure and how much should be that that is around 10 millimeters of mercury and most of the times these patients are managed in the prone position rather than the supine position. So why because there will be re recruitment of the dependent lung zones when you make the individual to lie down in prone position and manage okay so this is about the important points related to ARDS now you need to differentiate the chest x-ray in case of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema that is ARDS from the cardiogenic pulmonary edema in non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema you will have diffuse bilateral pulmonary opacities that means throughout the lung you are having this opacity but in case of cardiogenic pulmonary edema you have this characteristic Bat wing appearance, that means the perihilar 
interstitial infiltrates or alveolar infiltrate will be there. So, that is what is the characteristic back wing appearance in case of the cardiogenic pulmonary edema, right. Now, after having discussed about the ARDS, the next important topic for the discussion or revision will be the COPD, that is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, you have two important components. One is chronic bronchitis and the other one is the emphysema. And what type of disease is your chronic obstructive pulmonary disease? As the word itself tells you, it's an OLD. So, how can you tell that it is an OLD? That is by your pulmonary function test. What will the pulmonary function test do? Uh, will be in case of OLD? That is, your FEV1 by FVC will be less than 70% in case of the obstructive uh, lung disease, right? Now, what is the name of the criteria to decide the CVRT of your COPD is the GOLD criteria. So, what does this GOLD stands for? The word GOLD stands for Global Initiative for Obstructive Lung Disease, right? Global Initiative for Obstructive Lung Disease. So, to call it as very severe COPD, according to the GOLD criteria, what exactly is the answer? So, your FEV1 by FVC will be reduced in all the forms, mild, moderate, severe, very severe, everything in your FEV1 by FVC will be reduced, that is less than 0.7 or less than 70%. But how much should be your FEV1 to call it as very severe COPD? So, to call it as very severe COPD, your FEV1 should be less than 30%. That is the point when we call it as the very severe COPD. And remember, your COPD, it is the disease of the smaller airways. Now, what is the definition of the smaller airway? Definition of smaller airway is that when the internal diameter of the airway, if it is less than 2 mm and there is absence of the cartilage, right, there is absence of the cartilage, then we call it as the smaller airways. So, non-cartilaginous airways and internal diameter less than 2 mm, we call it as the smaller airways. And where do the smaller airways start from? See, we have totally 23 generations of airways. From 8th generation onwards, distally up to the alveoli, right, from 8th generation onwards, distally up to the alveoli, you have the smaller airways, right. We call it as the smaller airways. Now, what are all the examples for your smaller airway disease? It is not only COPD. There are many other conditions like the hypersensitivity pneumonitis, that is also a smaller airway disease. Then, bronchiolitis that is also the smaller airway disease, then mineral dust pneumoconiosis, right, mineral dust pneumoconiosis, that is also the smaller airway disease, okay. So, these are the examples of the smaller airway diseases. Now, very important point of discussion in the COPD <coughs> is about the chronic bronchitis. In chronic bronchitis, they will have cough with mucoid expectoration for consecutively two years for three months, right. So, every year three months, like consecutively two years, they'll have cough with mucoid expectoration. Now, in these patients with chronic bronchitis, why is that you have that mucoid expectoration? That is because of the hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the mucous glands. So, we calculate the read index to assess the CVRT of the chronic bronchitis. And how do you calculate this read index? It is the ratio of thickness of the submucosal glands, right? It is the ratio of thickness of the submucosal glands to that of the entire thickness of the bronchial wall, right, to that of the entire thickness of the bronchial wall, that is what is called the read index. And how much is the normal value of your read index? Normal value of your read index is 0.44 plus or minus 0.09. But whereas in patients with a chronic bronchitis, the read index, it is around 0.52 plus or minus 0.08. Right, so that will be the read index in case of chronic bronchitis. Why more is your hypertrophy and hyperplasia of the submucosal glands, more will be your read index in case of chronic bronchitis, and that will tell you the CVRT of chronic bronchitis. Right, and what is the important risk factor for the development of chronic bronchitis is the cigarette smoking. Right, next, then you need to know about the emphysema. So, emphysema not only cigarette smoking, the other important factor which is responsible for development of emphysema is alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency. Right, this alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency is associated with which type of emphysema? It is associated with pan asinar emphysema. And this centri asinar emphysema, it is very commonly seen in smokers. Right, commonly seen in smokers. Now, what do you understand by this word, the pan asinar emphysema? The pan asinar emphysema is that it is the entire asinus is abnormally irreversibly dilated. What are all the parts of the asinus? Respiratory bronchiole will be there, alveolar duct will be there, 
alveolar sac will be there and alveoli will be there. So these four parts, respiratory bronchial, alveolar duct, alveolar sac and alveoli, everything will be abnormally irreversibly dilated that is called as the pan asnar emphysema that is seen in patients with the alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency. Whereas you take in case of centri asnar emphysema, what did I tell you? It is the one which is commonly seen in smokers. And in centri asnar emphysema, it is only the respiratory bronchioles which are abnormally irreversibly dilated. In case of the centri asnar emphysema, the distal part of the asinus, right? The distal part of the asinus, that is alveolar sac and alveoli, they are not abnormally irreversibly dilated. It is only the respiratory bronchial which is abnormally irreversibly dilated in case of the centri asnar emphysema. Then next we have paraseptal emphysema. See, in case of paraseptal emphysema, it is the distal part of the asinus which is abnormally irreversibly dilated, right? And what is the distal part of the asinus? That will be your alveolar sac, alveoli and alveolar duct. So, alveolar duct, alveolar sac and then alveoli. These are abnormally irreversibly dilated in paraseptal emphysema and which part of the lung is commonly affected in paraseptal emphysema is the peripheral part of the lung. And these asinus, if they rupture, the individual may develop the pneumothorax. The individual may develop pneumothorax. Now, see, in chronic bronchitis, the common presentation will be in the form of cough with expectoration. But whereas in emphysema, the most common presentation will be in the form of dyspnea. Right? And how do you classify this particular CVRT of dyspnea? In case of cardiology, we have discussed as NYHA, that is New York Heart Association. But whereas here, it is Modified Medical Research Council, that is MMRC Council for uh, scale for assessment of CVRT of dyspnea. So where you have grade 0 to grade 4. Grade 0 is that where the individual can breathe, right? There is no breathlessness in grade 0. But breathlessness will be there only on strenuous exercise. But while doing ordinary activity or less than ordinary activity, there is no breathlessness. But when the individual does strenuous activity, then there will be breathlessness that is grade 0. And what is grade 4? Grade 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Grade 4 is that the individual will have dyspnea at rest. So that is what is your MMRC. Now, the next thing is how will you diagnose your COPD? Diagnosis of your COPD is by your pulmonary function test where you have the FEV1, right, where you have FEV1 by FVC which is being reduced less than 70 percent. Hmm? FEV1 by FVC is being reduced less than 70 percent. That is what is the pulmonary function test in patients with the obstructive lung disease. Emphysema is what? It's an obstructive lung disease, right? So in emphysema and as well as chronic bronchitis, you have your FEV1 by FVC less than 70 percent. And the other methods by which you can diagnose your emphysema and chronic bronchitis is by chest x-ray. So, what will the chest x-ray shows? Chest x-ray will show you that there is bilateral hyperlucent lung fields. Right? Bilateral hyperlucent lung fields. And these particular lungs which are hyperinflated, they overlap the heart and thereby it, the heart appears as the tubular heart. And these lungs which are abnormally irreversibly dilated, they compress the diaphragm. So, thereby you have the low set diaphragm. Then you also have the presence of blebs, right? And these blebs, when they rupture, they can develop pneumothorax, right? And the other, the, if you take the chest x-ray in case of chronic bronchitis, in chronic bronchitis, you will notice that there is increased bronchovascular markings, right? There is increased bronchovascular markings. So when will you call increased bronchovascular markings? When bronchovascular markings are present beyond two-thirds, right? When bronchovascular markings are present beyond two-thirds of your uh, lung field, then we call it as the prominent bronchovascular markings. And what is the criteria to assess the CVRT of your COPD? That is the gold criteria. And what is the parameter that we take into consideration for assessing the CVRT is, that is FEV1, right, FEV1. So when do you call mild COPD, right, you call it as mild COPD when your FEV1 percentage or FEV1 is more than 80 percentage of the predicted value and when do you call it as moderate COPD that is when your FEV1 if it is around 50 to 79 percentage of the predicted value and when will you assess the uh, when will you call it as severe COPD when your FEV1 if it is around 
thirty to forty nine percentage of the predicted value, we call it as severe COPD. And when do you call it as the very severe COPD? Very severe COPD, we call it as when your FEV one is less than thirty percentage of the predicted value. And accordingly, we decide the treatment in patients with the COPD. In case of your mild, we just give only short acting beta agonist, that is your salbutamol and as well as terbutalin. But whereas in case of moderate, we add lava. What is lava? That is salmetrol and as well as formetrol. Whereas in case of severe form of COPD, that is the point when we had inhaled corticosteroid, right? We add inhaled corticosteroid. Whereas in very severe form of COPD, we need to add long term oxygen, right? We need to add long term oxygen along with all these. That is what we do in case of severe COPD. So this is what is your gold criteria. So what do you understand by this word gold? That is global initiative. For obstructive lung disease, that is what is your gold criteria, right? Now, so after having discussed about COPD, which is one of the obstructive lung disease, the next important form of the obstructive lung disease for quick revision is the bronchial asthma. So, bronchial asthma is also an obstructive lung disease, right? This is also an obstructive lung disease. Now, what is the difference between COPD and as well as bronchial asthma? Bronchial asthma, you will have reversible airway disease. But whereas COPD, it is an irreversible airway disease. That is the important point of difference between these two. Now, you take in bronchial asthma, like what are the important features? Which one of the following value is not a feature of acute severe asthma? Pulses paradoxes, PaO2 less than kilopascals, 8 kilopascals. Okay, you multiply it by 7, you get it in millimeters of mercury. And heart rate more than 110, peak expiratory flow rate, 60 to 70 percentage of the expected value. So, which among this is not the feature of the acute severe asthma? So, in case of the acute severe form of asthma, which is nothing but your status asthmaticus, you will have pulses paradoxes. And what will happen to your PAO2 value? The PAO2 value will be reduced. And how much will be that PAO2 value that will be reduced in case of the acute severe form of asthma or in case of severe form of asthma? The PAO2 value will be less than 40 percent but here it is around 56 millimeters of mercury and the heart rate more than 110 right that is a true statement but which of the following is not the feature i'm sorry one second one, one second so it should be less than 60 percent pao2 less than 60 percent okay right. here it is 56 which is a correct point now which is not seen is the peak expiratory flow rate how much should be the peak expiratory flow rate in case of the severe form of the asthma the peak expiratory flow rate should be less than 25 percent if it is like status asthmaticus and if it is just old see what is the difference between status asthmaticus and severe is status asthmaticus it is acute very severe form of asthma where your peak expiratory flow rate is less than 25 percent but if your peak expiratory flow rate if it is like 25 to 40 percent we call it as the severe form of asthma Okay, so which of the following is not the feature of acute severe asthma now? That will be your uh, peak expiratory flow rate 60 to 70 percentage of the predicted value. That is the incorrect statement. Now, in patients with bronchial asthma, if you take the airways, the airways, you know, they are thick and as well as inflamed. And this particular airways, they contain the abnormal substances. You will have like V's because of the thickening of the airways. The classical presentation in case of bronchial asthma will be V's. Along with these, you will have cough with expectoration. Right, you will have cough with expectoration. Now, what will the expectoration in case of the asthma will be? Right, it contains the Kirschman spirals. What are Kirschman spirals? That is the spiral shaped mucus plugs. Right, the presence of the spiral shaped mucus plugs that will be the Kirschman spirals. Then, what are the Criola bodies? The Criola bodies are, that is, sloughed, ciliated columnar cells, right, sloughed, ciliated columnar cells, that will be your Criola bodies. And lastly, you have charcoal laden crystals. Charcoal laden crystals, like how, we, how they will be, they are like slender and pointed at both ends. Right, they are slender and pointed at both ends, consisting of a pair of the hexagonal pyramids. And what are the conditions where you can have this charcoal laden crystals? Is apart from asthma, 
you can have that in other eosinophilic inflammatory pathologies like parasitic infection like entamoeba histolytica you can have this charcoal laden crystals so these are the three important features that you will have in sputum that is kirschman spirals criolla bodies and as well as the charcoal laden crystals now you need to know a few important points about the status asthmaticus or the acute severe asthma so these patients they cannot speak because of the severe respiratory distress and if at all if they want to speak they can just speak single words that is they speak in monosyllables and the respiratory rate will be definitely be elevated that is more than 30 per minute and these patients the characteristic pulse will be that is pulses paradoxes will be there then how will be the ronchi the ronchi in these individuals will be the loud ronchi right loud ronchi and these patients they develop type 2 respiratory failure because carbon dioxide washout does not occur because of severe bronchospasm so that will result in the hypoxia and as well as the hypercapnia that is what is nothing but your type 2 respiratory failure now what will be the drug of choice in these individuals drug of choice in these individuals will be short acting beta agonist that is salbutamol nebulization should be taken and other drugs that we give is we give the intravenous hydrocortisone and next the oxygen supplementation so this will be the treatment uh, options in case of status asthmaticus or acute severe asthma then we have another important variant of asthma that is called brittle asthma what is this brittle asthma some patients they show chaotic variation in lung function despite taking appropriate therapy so how much will be that chaotic variation the diurnal variation of peak expiratory flow rate more than 40% see early in the morning if you take the peak expiratory flow rate it is something like 80% and later in the evening if you see peak, peak expiratory flow rate if it is like something 30% that means your peak expiratory flow rate is reduced more than 40% then we call it as the brittle asthma and this brittle asthma we have two types type 1 and as well as type 2 brittle asthma type 1 brittle asthma is that shows a persistent pattern of variability right there will be persistent pattern of variability and these patients they require the oral steroids right these patients they require the oral steroids whereas type 2 brittle asthma is that where the individual will have near normal lung function right normal or near normal lung function but there will be precipitous unpredictable fall in the lung function right precipitous unpredictable fall of the lung function that we call it as the type 2 brittle asthma and here the drug of choice will be the subcutaneous adrenaline right subcutaneous adrenaline okay now how is your asthma diagnosed the asthma is being diagnosed by your fev1 so what is the role of this fev1 is mainly in the spirometry that will assess the reversibility status hmm? that will assess the reversibility status that means right that means you have to check the baseline FEV1, then you need to give salbutamol nebulization, and you have to check, wait for 10 to 15 minutes. So, once you get one, is you get a baseline. Second is after giving salbutamol nebulization, wait for 10 to 15 minutes, right? Then you check the FEV1. If supposed, if the FEV1, if it is increased more than 12% or more than 200 ml, this suggests that the patient is suffering with bronchial asthma and if it is less than 12 percent or less than 200 ml increase then we call it as the COPD hmm? then we call it as the COPD that is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease now depending upon your FEV1 value percentage we assess the CVRT of COPD right what is that if the uh, FEV1 if it is more than 70 percent then we call it as mild right and if the fev1 if it is around 40 to 69 percent then we call it as the moderate and if the fev1 value if it is less than 40 percent we call it as the severe and if it is less than 25 percent then we call it as the very severe right we call it as the very severe okay so these are the various forms of asthma and their respective classification depending upon your pulmonary function test right now I'll just show you some questions here. So treatment like what will be the treatment like you need to give the stepwise approach. If it is like mild asthma, you need to give short acting beta agonist. Then if it is mild persistent along with short acting beta agonist, you also need to add the steroids, inhaled steroids. 
Whereas in moderate persistent, you need to give inhaled steroids, theophylline, and then inhale beta 2 agonist. Then severe persistent asthma, you need to give oral steroids. Okay. Now you see this question here. A known asthmatic presented to emergency department with severe exacerbation not relieved by salbutamol. Patient was given corticosteroid and aminophilin. What is the rationale of giving corticosteroid? No, no, no. So, your uh, corticosteroids, they don't have the bronchodilatory activity. Right? And they don't decrease, increase the mucociliary clearance. The advantage is that the corticosteroids, they facilitate the beta 2 agonist. Right? They facilitate the beta 2 agonist. Okay? That is what is the importance of the corticosteroids. Why we need to give along with the beta 2 agonist. So, this completes the discussion of the bronchial asthma. Then, next important topic for the quick revision is the cystic fibrosis, which is also an obstructive lung disease. Which is also an obstructive lung disease. So, this cystic fibrosis, it is an inherited disorder. And the type of inheritance is autosomal recessive type of inheritance and it is a multi-system disorder. The first signs and symptoms, they typically occur in the childhood, right? They typically occur within the childhood. And what is the gene that is being mutated for the development of your uh, cystic fibrosis is, that is the CFTR gene that is being mutated. And this CFTR gene is present on the chromosome 7, right? It is present on chromosome 7. Now, what will be the clinical presentation in neonates? In neonates, the presentation will be in the form of the meconium ileus, hmm, where the meconium is unable to come out of the GAT of the individual. And how will you take out that uh, feces? That is by enema. And that particular enema will be gastrographin enema. Right? That enema will be the gastrographin enema. And these patients, the mucus secretions, they are very thick mucus secretions. And this thick mucus secretions, they make the individual to develop the recurrent pneumonia because that organism will come and get stuck within the mucus and that can cause the infection. And that is what is responsible for your recurrent pneumonia. Then you take the bronchiectasis. Bronchiectasis mainly involves the upper lung fields. Right? Bronchiectasis mainly involves the upper lung fields. Okay? Right? Because these patients with cystic fibrosis, they develop bronchiectasis. And which form, which part of the lung is being affected in case of cystic fibrosis by bronchiectasis? That is the upper lung fields. Then you take the biliary fluid secretion. Even your biliary fluid secretion, it also becomes very thick. When the biliary fluid secretion becomes thick, that is the point when they develop what is called secondary biliary cirrhosis. Right? And this secondary biliary cirrhosis, there can be even the formation of the gallstones. Then next is the osmotic diarrhea. Why is that you get this osmotic diarrhea? See, pancreatic juice contains an enzyme called amylase which is responsible for sugar absorption. But what has happened to pancreatic juice in cystic fibrosis? The pancreatic juice has become thick and thereby there is fall in the serum amylase levels. Once the pancreatic uh, amylase levels are reduced, then the sugar absorption will be reduced. So that will, and the sugar which is present within the GAT will secrete the fluid into the GAT and thereby there can be development of diarrhea and that we call it as the osmotic diarrhea, right, osmotic diarrhea. Next important point is the infertility. So why is that there will be infertility in males, sorry, in females, the infertility is because of increase in the cervical mucus thickness, right, increase in the cervical mucus thickness. But whereas in males, why is that there is infertility in cystic fibrosis? That is because of development of azoospermia, right? Azoospermia is caused due to agenesis of the vas difference, hmm? agenesis of vas difference. And another, so investigations if you take, that is number one, the sweat chloride concentration, that will be, right, that will be more than 60 milli equivalents per uh, liter on two occasions. And you can have false positive elevation of your sweat chloride in case of the addisons. Then the investigation of choice will be the genetic analysis that is CFTR mutation analysis should be done, right? That is by using exonic sequencing. Then what is the treatment? You need to give targeted therapies. See, targeted therapies include several drugs that modulate CFTR trafficking, that will modulate CFTR folding, that will modulate the CFTR function. So what are those the targeted therapies? These targeted therapies, they include the IVACAFTER. 
right they include the iva captor which is a potential of the cftr channel and what are the other drugs which can improve the cftr protein folding that is luma captor then tiza captor then elixa captor so these are the targeted therapies that you need to give in these individuals right and next is lastly the lung transplantation lung transplantation is the only right lung transplantation is only the definitive treatment for advanced cystic fibrosis right and what is that you need to do not only lung transplantation it should be double right double lung heart transplantation should be done in case of the cystic fibrosis so this completes the discussion of cystic fibrosis which is an obstructive lung disease and one more important obstructive lung disease will be the bronchiectasis bronchiectasis is also an obstructive lung disease and which particular generations are irreversibly dilated in bronchiectasis that is fifth to ninth generation which is abnormally irreversibly dilated in case of the bronchiectasis and you need to know that bronchiectasis is more common in which lobe bronchiectasis it is more common in the left lower lobe because the airway going to the left lower limb like it is very longer so that is the reason why bronchiectasis is more common in the left lower lobe and depending upon the shape of abnormally irreversibly dilated bronchi we classify the bronchiectasis into three types cylindrical saccular and cystic out of which the most common will be the cylindrical form of the bronchiectasis right now you should know what is the condition where you will have mid lung field bronchiectasis mid lung field bronchiectasis is seen in mycobacterium avium infection abpa tuberculosis post radiation fibrosis so the answer is mycobacterium avium infection now let me tell you what are all the conditions where you will have the upper lobe bronchiectasis upper lobe bronchiectasis you come across this in tuberculosis cystic fibrosis then allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis and even post radiation fibrosis then what is the condition where you will have mid lung bronchiectasis that is what is our question that is mycobacterium avium infections and even the immotile cilia syndrome lower lung bronchiectasis you come across this in case of chronic recurrent aspiration so chronic recurrent aspiration can cause the lower lung bronchiectasis central bronchiectasis is that you come across in case of the allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis and as well as the cystic fibrosis these are the two conditions where you can have the central bronchiectasis then what are the, what is the workup one is your sputum analysis when you do a sputum examination by keeping the sputum bedside you get this classical three layered sputum where the upper layer upper layer it is like completely frothy and watery the middle layer is that which contain the turbid and mucopurulent material and lower layer is that which contains the purulent and as well as which gives the opaque nature of the three layered sputum then what is the first line investigation is chest x ray chest x ray may be normal or it will give you the classical tram track appearance hmm? classical tram track appearance but what is the most accurate investigation the most accurate investigation will be the hrct that is high resolution ct scan see high resolution ct scan is that which will give you the classical description of the appearance of abnormally irreversibly dilated bronchi right so what is this description considered as this description of the hrct is considered as the tree in bud appearance hmm? tree in bud appearance and one more important is the development of the signet ring sign right the development of the signet ring sign so that is what is the ct scan picture in patients with the bronchiectasis and if you want to visualize the bronchus then you need to do bronchography then how do you treat these patients see for the treatment of the uh, massive hemoptysis you need to do bronchial artery embolization right you need to do bronchial artery embolization so this completes the discussion of your obstructive lung diseases what all we have discussed that is your asthma then bronchitis or bronchiectasis then cystic fibrosis or copd so we are done with the discussion of the obstructive lung diseases right now if you take the topic uh so yesterday the last topic was the bronchiectasis so the next topic for today is the bronchogenic carcinoma so bronchogenic carcinoma is one particular clinical condition where you can have the presence of clubbing 
there are actually many respiratory conditions where there can be clubbing. What are the respiratory conditions where you will have clubbing? Interstitial lung diseases, cystic fibrosis, lung abscess, then your bronchogenic carcinoma and even in case of necrotizing pneumonia, these are all the conditions where you will have clubbing. But in case of bronchogenic carcinoma, we have four types of bronchogenic carcinoma out of which, in which type of bronchogenic carcinoma, the clubbing is least common, right? Any one of you? So, please remember the clubbing is least common in case of the small cell carcinoma of the lung, right? Now, let me just quickly, right, tell you all the important points related to the bronchogenic carcinoma. So, if the question is asked, like, what is the most benign tumor of the lung? The most benign tumor of the lung, it is the hamartoma. So, hamartoma, it is the most benign tumor of the lung. And overall, if you take the lung pathology, what is the most common cause of recurrent hemoptysis? Most common cause of the recurrent hemoptysis will be bronchial adenoma, right? That will be the most common cause of the recurrent hemoptysis. And what exactly among various malignancies like what we can have in the individual, what is the most common cause of cancer death? The most common cause of the cancer death will be bronchogenic carcinoma. Right? That would be the most common cause of the cancer death. And what is the most common risk factor for the development of bronchogenic carcinoma? The most common risk factor will be the smoking. Now, apart from smoking, what is the most common natural risk factor that can cause bronchogenic carcinoma is the exposure to radon gas. Right? Exposure to radon gas. This is an environmental pollutant that can cause bronchogenic carcinoma. And the next important point is, uh, in these patients with bronchogenic carcinoma, like we have four important types of bronchogenic carcinoma. That is small cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma and large cell carcinoma. Now, out of which you take this uh, adenocarcinoma. Adenocarcinoma is the one which can cause the pancos tumor. Now, in case of pancos tumor, uh, which rib is affected? It is the first rib which will undergo the erosion. Right? It is the first rib which will undergo the erosion. And what are the most common nerve roots which are involved in the pancos tumor? The most common nerve roots which are involved in pancos tumor is C8, T1 and as well as T2. So these are the most common nerve roots which are involved in the pancos tumor. Now among all these types of bronchogenic carcinoma, what is the most frequent histological type of bronchogenic carcinoma? Most frequent histological type of bronchogenic carcinoma will be adenocarcinoma all over the world but particularly if the question is asked like what is the most common type of bronchogenic carcinoma in India then the answer will be squamous cell carcinoma right and what is the most common histological variety which is seen in non-smokers that will be adenocarcinoma whereas the remaining all types of bronchogenic carcinomas they can occur in smokers or they occur in smokers but the one which is seen in non-smokers will be the adenocarcinoma. And even in young patients also, the most common bronchogenic carcinoma will be the adenocarcinoma. And even the most common histological variety in females is also the adenocarcinoma. Right? So, these are some of the important points on the adenocarcinoma. The next is the most common site for metastasis from carcinoma lung. That means from carcinoma lung, which particular organ will take that metastasis most commonly? That will be the liver. Now, apart from that, if the question is asked, what is the most common endocrine organ to be involved by carcinoma, endocrine organ to be involved by metastasis of the carcinoma lung, that will be the adrenal gland, right, that will be the adrenal gland. So, adrenal gland, it is the most common endocrine organ to be involved by metastasis of the carcinoma lung. Now, the next question is, from carcinoma lung, which metastasis will get transmitted to the opposite lung that means in which type of bronchogenic carcinoma like the metastasis can be transmitted to the opposite lung the answer will be adenocarcinoma because adenocarcinoma is a peripheral type the, in adenocarcinoma the part of lung which is being affected is the peripheral part of the lung so from that peripheral part of the lung it can easily metastasize to the opposite lung and what is the most common tumor that will metastasize to the heart that will be bronchogenic carcinoma so, you have to understand the question here. From bronchogenic carcinoma, to which organ the metastasis most commonly goes is to the liver. But the question is like most common tumor which will metastasize to the heart. That means to the heart, which bronchogenic carcinoma, oh, sorry, which type of malignancy commonly metastasizes. That will be bronchogenic carcinoma. And what are the histological varieties that will cavitate? The cavitation is seen in case of large cell carcinoma, 
and as well as the squamous cell carcinoma right large cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma is the one they are the histological varieties that we cavity now what is the histological variety that is having central in distribution the histological variety that is central in distribution will be squamous cell carcinoma that is what is the bronchogenic carcinoma which has central in distribution and the type of bronchogenic carcinoma which has peripheral distribution will be the adenocarcinoma so adenocarcinoma is the one which has the peripheral distribution right whereas your squamous cell carcinoma small cell carcinoma are those which have the central distribution next most common variety associated with the paraneoplastic syndrome the one which is associated with paraneoplastic syndrome will be small cell carcinoma now what do you understand by the word paraneoplastic syndrome is this small cell carcinoma is associated with the development of syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone and it is associated with the development of the cushing syndrome right so this will be the paraneoplastic syndromes which are associated with the small cell carcinoma and one more important question is which is the type of bronchogenic carcinoma most commonly associated with hypokalemia right the type of bronchogenic carcinoma associated with hypokalemia will be small cell carcinoma now why is that right why is that why because this small cell carcinoma will be a source for the ectopic acth secretion causing cushing syndrome and this ectopic acth causing cushing syndrome whenever the steroids are produced in excess quantity in cushing syndrome that steroids will go and activate the enac channels that is epithelial sodium channels within the distal convoluted tubule and once the epithelial sodium channels are activated there will be sodium and water retention and then potassium excretion and that is the reason why there will be hypokalemia in case of small cell carcinoma and most common histological variety that is associated with hypercalcemia will be squamous cell carcinoma now why is that because squamous cell carcinoma is a source for the release of parathormone related protein and this parathormone related protein is the one which will increase or stimulate the parathormone production and that will cause bone resorption resulting in hypercalcemia and histological variety most responsive to chemotherapy and as well as the radiotherapy will be small cell carcinoma right because small cell carcinoma is the most aggressive tumor right it's a most aggressive tumor there is very high chance of metastasis to the distant organs which one small cell carcinoma which is also called oat cell carcinoma and this small cell carcinoma because it has the higher tendency of metastasis surgery will be of no use in case of small cell carcinoma you have to give only chemotherapy in case of small cell carcinoma whereas the histological variety with best prognosis that will be squamous cell carcinoma right this squamous cell carcinoma and as well as adenocarcinoma like most of it they are like localized tumors so we can do surgical treatment in case of squamous cell carcinoma and as well as adenocarcinoma but in case of small cell carcinoma <coughs> surgery won't suffice because there is high chance of metastasis so that is the reason why chemotherapy would be the best for small cell carcinoma so these are some of the important points related to bronchogenic carcinoma and you also need to know right what are the tumor markers for bronchogenic carcinoma that includes carcino embryonic antigen now what does this carcino embryonic antigen presents tells you the carcino embryonic antigen presents tells you that the bronchogenic carcinoma is having metastasis right so it is a marker of right it is a marker of metastasis okay which one carcino embryonic antigen and one more important marker is neuron specific enolase this neuron specific enolase if it is being present it is the prognostic marker right this is a prognostic marker in small cell carcinoma of the lung okay so these are the two important tumor markers that are being asked previously right so having said about the bronchogenic carcinoma now we we'll move on to the next important topic that is pulmonary thromboembolism so in pulmonary thromboembolism the clinical manifestations completely depends upon the size of the embolus now if suppose if there is presence of massive pulmonary embolism massive pulmonary embolism the patient will have the dyspnea right the patient will have the dyspnea so dyspnea will be the most common symptom in patients with the pulmonary thromboembolism right and that to the dyspnea will be a sudden onset dyspnea right next the other important point is in case of massive pulmonary embolism there will be increased afterload on the right ventricle so thereby the interventricular septum from the right ventricle it is being pushed into the left ventricle usually the interventricular septum is present in between the right ventricle and left ventricle but here because of increased afterload on the right ventricle the interventricular septum is being pushed onto the left ventricle 
So the LV lumen reduces. Once the LV lumen size reduces, the cardiac output decreases and thereby there will be decrease in cerebral perfusion resulting in the syncopal attack. And why is this particular syncopal attack? That is because of the hypotension. Hmm? That is because of the hypotension. And another important manifestation is the cyanosis that is because of decreased oxygenation. So these are the symptoms suggestive of massive pulmonary embolism. Now what are the symptoms which are suggestive of the small emboli? See, this small emboli, they enter into the bronchial circulation causing the pulmonary infarction. And because of the pulmonary infarction, the individual can develop the pleuritic type of chest pain. Right, the patient develops the pleuritic type of chest pain. That is because of pulmonary infarction. And the other features of the small emboli is, there can be cough and there can be hemoptysis which can be seen. And the other manifestations are palpitations can also be there in patients with a small emboli. Now, what is very, very important here in case of pulmonary embolism is the diagnosis. So now, in case of pulmonary thromboembolism, what is the investigation of choice? The investigation of choice will be the CT pulmonary angiography. That is the investigation of choice. But in certain scenarios where we cannot use contrast, we cannot do CTPA. That is, uh, CT uh, pulmonary angiogram you cannot do in a scenarios where, like for example, a pregnant female presented with pulmonary embolism. Can you do a contrast, sorry, can you do a CT pulmonary angiogram? No, because there is high risk of radiation to the fetus. So in such case, what is the second best investigation will be ventilation perfusion scan. So that would be the second best investigation for the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. Now ECG manifestations are very important in pulmonary embolism, which have been asked uh, very frequently in the last exams. In acute pulmonary embolism, what do you think is the most frequent ECG finding? S1, Q3, T3 pattern, P pulmonary, sinus tachycardia, right axis deviation. So once you get this particular type of question, many of you are uh, having the highest tendency to go with S1, Q3, T3 pattern. Let me tell you that is not the most common uh, or most frequent ECG finding in pulmonary embolism. The most frequent ECG finding in pulmonary embolism is the sinus tachycardia. This S1, Q3, T3 pattern, it is present only in 7 to 10 percentage of patients with the pulmonary embolism. Now, what are the other features of pulmonary embolism next to the sinus tachycardia? Definitely one point is sinus tachycardia. The other ECG finding of uh, pulmonary embolism is that in these patients with pulmonary embolism, like what happens is there is increased afterload on the right ventricle. So, you will have the features of the right heart strain pattern, right? You will have the features of the right heart strain pattern. Now, what are those features of the right heart strain pattern, right? Number one, that is right axis deviation. Next is the development of the right ventricular hypertrophy. It may not be an acute event. In case of chronic pulmonary embolism, there can be development of right ventricular hypertrophy. But what are the other features of the right heart strain pattern apart from right axis deviation? The other features will be the development of RBBB, that is right bundle branch block pattern can be there. And there will be inverted T waves in V1 to V3, right? Inverted T waves in V1 to V3, okay? And there will be also ST segment depression in V1 to V3. Okay, so these are the features of or these are the ECG changes that is being present within the pulmonary embolism, right? Next, then yes, this is what is your S1, Q3, T3 pattern. This S1, Q3, T3 pattern is present only in 7 to 10 percentage of patients, right? That is, you have the presence of deep S wave in lead V1, sorry, lead 1, I'm sorry, deep S wave in lead 1, then you have the deep Q wave in lead 3 and then inverted T wave in lead 3. So this is what is called as the S1, Q3, T3 pattern. Now the next important uh, investigations in pulmonary embolism which have been asked previously is the chest x-ray. In which clinical condition do you see this particular sign? That is nothing but your Hampton's hump. What is Hampton's hump? The presence of the wedge-shaped infarct. And you come across this Hampton's hump in case of pulmonary embolism. But the sensitivity of these uh, x-ray findings are very less. The sensitivity of this Hampton's hump is only 21%. So they are not 100% sensitive, but if this particular x-ray is being given the, with wedge-shaped infarct, that is suggestive of the pulmonary embolism. Next, the next important you can see here, what are the chest x-ray findings and in which clinical condition you can have here. So you can observe here that there is enlarged or dilated, right, dilated, right descending pulmonary artery. Hmm? There is enlarged right descending pulmonary artery. Now, the presence of dilated or enlarged right descending pulmonary artery, like what exactly is this sign? This sign is called as the Pallas sign. Okay. 
and why is that uh, there will be dilatation of right descending pulmonary artery that is because of the pulmonary hypertension next is what are the chest x-ray findings and what is the diagnosis in this uh, scenario so if you take this chest x-ray so in this chest x-ray you can see right that there is the this is nothing but your western mark sign right western mark sign okay so right where there is okay so these are the three important signs one is your the hampton sum where you have wedge shaped infarct enlargement of right descending pulmonary artery that is pallas sign and next is the western mark sign okay right now after having discussed about the chest x-ray the next important is about the d dimer so d dimer is definitely elevated in patients with pulmonary embolism but not only in pulmonary embolism there are many other conditions where the d dimer can be elevated but the question is d dimer values may be elevated in all of the following conditions except this is one of the pyq right myocardial infarction pneumonia anticoagulant therapy and pregnancy so please remember in case of the anticoagulant therapy d dimer value is not elevated because when the patient is on anticoagulant therapy there is no thrombus formation and what exactly is your d dimer d dimer it is a fibrin degradation product right d dimer it is a fibrin degradation product that is what is your d dimer okay now this fibrin degradation product comes from the thrombus when the patient is on anticoagulant where is the question of thrombus formation no thrombus formation when there is no thrombus there is no fibrin degradation product so d dimer value may be increased in all of the following conditions except that is anticoagulation therapy the investigation of choice just now we have discussed that is ct pulmonary angiogram that is the investigation of choice now how do you treat these patients with the pulmonary embolism so this is one clinical scenario which has been asked previously a young patient presents to the emergency with acute pulmonary embolism patient's blood pressure is normal but ecg reveals right ventricular hypokinesia and compromised cardiac output the treatment in this patient will be thrombolytic therapy then anticoagulation with low molecular weight heparin anticoagulation with warfarin inferior vena cava filter so how is that you will manage this patient so remember uh, the treatment in case of pulmonary embolism it all depends upon the cvrt of pulmonary embolism like what is that like for example you see this table if the individual with pulmonary embolism is having normal blood pressure and normal right ventricle right in that case just give anticoagulants right anticoagulants that's all but if there is recurrent pulmonary embolism then you put the patient on ivc filter that is one scenario and you take the second scenario the patient with pulmonary embolism is having hypotension then in that particular patient you need to do anticoagulation plus thrombolysis or if required embolectomy should be done that is if a patient with pulmonary embolism having hypotension and what is the reason for hypotension we have discussed but our patient which the clinical scenario which i have given to you it comes under this this third one that is the patient's blood pressure is normal but there is rv hypokinesia so you can see here what is there in this patient the blood pressure of this individual is normal but there is rv hypokinesia now in this scenario what is that you have to do is that you need to individualize the risk assessment for suppose if the individual is a young patient where there is no bleeding risk in this patient you can do you can do thrombolytic therapy the patient is a young patient but in the same scenario if it is there in elderly individuals where there is increased risk of bleeding so in this patient where there is where the patient is having like comorbidities and high risk of bleeding in this patients we just give only the anticoagulants we don't give the thrombolytic therapy okay so this is how you need to manage a patient with the pulmonary embolism now next important thing in case of pulmonary embolism is about the criteria the name of the criteria is the modified wells criteria for diagnosis of pulmonary embolism and what has been asked uh, one uh, in one of the exam is which among the following is not the variable or which of the following is not the parameter in modified wells criteria so you have to know what are the variables which have been taken signs and symptoms of dbt present or absent alternative diagnosis less likely than pulmonary embolism that means there should not be any other uh, predisposing condition for causing shortness of breath in this individual heart rate more than 100 is there or not immobilization for more than 3 days is is it there or not uh, prior pulmonary embolism history or dbt history is there or not and is there hemoptysis and as well as the malignancy so what has been included uh, in the mcq was the cyanosis right which among the following 
clinical variable is not the part of modified wells criteria cyanosis is not the part of the modified wells criteria but does cyanosis develop in pulmonary embolism yes it can develop but it is not the variable of the modified wells criteria now once the scoring system is being taken like for suppose if the individual is having a score of more than 6 in modified wells criteria so you have to assume that there is high probability of right there is high probability of pulmonary embolism in this patient and if the score is like 2 to 6 then the patient is having moderate probability of development of the pulmonary embolism and if the score is less than 2 then the patient is having low probability of development of pulmonary embolism so this is what is your modified wells criteria which is useful in diagnosis of the pulmonary embolism so with this we are done with the topic of the pulmonary embolism where the patient will present with the sudden onset dyspnea right and yes the next important topic for the discussion will be the pleural disorders and in this pleural disorders let me take up the discussion of the pleural effusion okay so like you need to know how much is the normal quantity of the pleural fluid normal quantity of the pleural fluid is around 5 to 15 ml and if the quantity of the fluid which is developed which is accumulated in the pleural space that is in between parietal pleura and visceral pleura if it is like more than 20 to 30 ml we call it as the pleural effusion now this pleural effusion depending upon the content right depending upon the constituents within the uh, pleural fluid we classify that into two types that is the transudative type of pleural effusion and as well as the exudative type of pleural effusion so what is the basic difference between these two see the protein content in case of transudate it is around 3 grams per deciliter whereas in exudate it is more than 3 grams per deciliter right in exudate it is more than 3 grams per deciliter and fluid protein to the serum protein ratio in transudate it is less than 0.5 whereas in exudate it is more than 0.5 whereas you take fluid LDH to the serum LDH ratio less than 0.6 in transudate and it is more than 0.6 in case of the exudate so these three variables are taken into consideration of a criteria called as the lights criteria so lights criteria if it is positive that is very much suggestive of exudative type of pleural effusion now what exactly should be there in the lights criteria these three variables should be there so if any one parameter is there out of these three suggestive of exudative uh, type of pleural effusion okay right so this is about like how you will diagnose whether it is a transudate or the exudate and the next important question you need to know is like what is the most common cause of pleural effusion most common cause of pleural effusion will be the congestive heart failure and most common cause of transudate also will be the congestive heart failure and most common cause of exudate will be the pneumonia right or the infectious pathology so next to this pneumonia you can also answer the tuberculosis so the tuberculosis and as well as the pneumonia these are the most common causes for the exudative type of the pleural effusion all right now having said about this now how will you diagnose this pleural effusion see that diagnosis the clinical manifestation of pleural effusion is that they can have gradual onset dyspnea right they'll have, they'll not have sudden onset dyspnea it's a gradual onset dyspnea right and on examination you will have the percussion note as a stony dull note and the trachea is deviated to the opposite side vocal phematis and vocal resonance is being reduced and on auscultation the breath sounds will be reduced hmm? on auscultation the breath sounds will be reduced that is what you will see in the pleural effusion right now next important is the chest x-ray in case of the pleural effusion chest x-ray in case of pleural effusion what is the earliest manifestation of the pleural effusion on the chest x-ray so there will be blunting of the postophrenic angle right there will be blunting of the postophrenic angle that is the earliest manifestation in the pleural effusion blunting of the postophrenic angle and the other changes will be there will be shift of the media steinum to the opposite side that is trachea is being shifted to the opposite side and there will be presence of the homogeneous opacity right the presence of the homogeneous opacity and the next important point is the curve right what is this curve this particular curve it is called as ellis s shaped curve right this curve it is called as the ellis s shaped curve that is what you will see in case of the pleural effusion now what exactly is this uh, x-ray suggestive of that is the presence of the horizontal fluid level see the presence of the horizontal fluid level it is seen in condition that is the hydropneumothorax right it is seen in condition that is the hydropneumothorax okay so what exactly is your hydropneumothorax that is the presence of the fluid and as well as the air that is called as the hydropneumothorax where you will have the presence of the horizontal fluid level on the 
chest x-ray. And the auscultation is very important in hydropneumothorax where you have the presence of the characteristic auscultatory finding that is called as the succussion splash. Right, that is called as succussion splash. That is characteristically seen in patients with the hydropneumothorax. Now, now in case of pleural effusion, when you have to do the pluricentesis, right? What is the point uh, you have to do pluricentesis? One is your clinical. For example, if the patient is having dyspnea, right? Because of massive pleural effusion, that is a clinical indication for doing pluricentesis. And but what is the radiological indication? You see this question. This is one of the PYQ. Therapeutic thoracocentesis should be performed if the free fluid in the lung separates the chest wall by greater than 5 mm, 10 mm, 15 mm and then 20 mm. So, this is the uh, chest x-ray indication when you have to do therapeutic thoracocentesis. Remember, the answer is the 10 mm. So, if the free fluid which is separating the lung and chest wall, if it is more than 10 mm, that is, point, that is the point when you have to do therapeutic thoracocentesis, right? Next. Now, I will show you one more clinical scenario. A car accident patient, that means an individual had an RTA, complaints of breathlessness, dyspnea. On examination, the blood pressure of the individual is 110 by 70 millimeters of mercury. And GCS is 15 by 15, which is a good GCS. On examination, the trachea shows deviation in the suprasternal notch. So, the trachea is being deviated in the suprasternal notch with reduced breath sounds in the left infra-axillary area and left inframammary area. But how are the uh, heart sounds? The S1 and S2 is normal in intensity and even splitting of your S2 is also normal. Chest X-ray is shown below. What is the best step in the management to, of this patient? Needle aspiration, pericardiosynthesis, chest tube insertion, immediate thoracotomy. Now, what exactly is the scenario of the patient? An individual who had a road traffic accident. So, what this patient would have been developed? This patient would have developed the hemothorax, right? This patient would have developed hemothorax. So, in a clinical scenario of hemothorax, that is needle aspiration will not be sufficient because it's a blood which is very thick in consistency. So, with the help of needle, you cannot take out that the blood which is present in the pleural space. So, in order to take out this particular fluid, what you have to do is the chest tube insertion. Right, the correct answer here will be the chest tube insertion. So, these are some of the very, very important points related to your the pleural effusion. And where exactly you need to uh, insert the needle when you are doing the pluricentesis is that, see, if you are inserting the needle in the mid axillary line, you have to insert the needle in the sixth intercostal space, the mid axillary line, and the position of the patient should be bent forward with arm extended over the couch. And where exactly you have to insert the needle within the intercostal space? You have to insert the needle. Yes, any one of you, please tell me where exactly you will insert the needle in the intercostal space. Right? You have to insert the needle over the upper border of the lower rib. Now, why exactly is that? Because in the other areas, you have the presence of neurovascular bundle. So that is the reason why the preferable area will be over the upper border of the lower rib. That is a preferable area where you need to do the pluricentesis by inserting the needle in the sixth intercostal space in the mid axillary line. So this is about the pluricentesis and as well as the pleural effusion. And next important respiratory emergency is about the pneumothorax. Now, what exactly is the hallmark of the pneumothorax? The hallmark of the pneumothorax is the collapsed lung. Right? That is the hallmark of the pneumothorax. That is the development of the collapsed lung. You understand? Now, whenever there is a collapsed lung, what will be the presentation of the patient? The individual will have sudden onset dyspnea. Right? The individual will have sudden onset dyspnea. And among the various types of pneumothorax, the important form of pneumothorax is the tension pneumothorax, which is an uh, important uh, respiratory emergency. And in which particular settings you get the development of tension pneumothorax? You come across this in the setting of penetrating trauma. You come across this in the setting of lung infection. You come across this when the individual is had undergone cardiopulmonary resuscitation or there is high positive pressure mechanical ventilation. So, in this particular setting, there is high chance of development of the tension pneumothorax. And these patients with the tension pneumothorax, you have to understand that the immediate management is that these patients, they require right white board needle insertion right you need to do immediate white board needle insertion and where exactly you do this white board needle insertion is that 
you have to insert the needle in the upper intercostal spaces that is usually in the second intercostal space in the midclavicular line right so there is a controversy on this particular uh, point where you have to do white bore needle insertion right uh, uh, you take the cmdt or you cmdt 2022 or you take the uh, harrison uh, 21st edition like they give very clearly that needle is needle should be inserted in the second intercostal space midclavicular line for tension pneumothorax as a first line treatment and after this the next step will be the chest tube drainage right the next step will be the chest tube drainage okay so this is what is your tension pneumothorax this is definitely an important medical emergency and if you don't treat these patients they will develop significant hypotension and there can be cardiovascular collapse and death of the individual okay right and the next important is the catamenial lung disorders what exactly is your catamenial lung disorders it is the one which come it is the one which you come across in pulmonary endometriosis right pulmonary endometriosis now what do you understand by this word pulmonary endometriosis that is the presence of the endometrial tissue outside the uterus that is either in the lung parenchyma or which is the pleura now these patients with catamenial lung disorders with every menstrual cycle right with every menstrual cycle there is chance of development of the pneumothorax that is what is called as the catamenial lung disorders right and what will be the important x-ray finding the important x-ray finding is that you will observe that there is collapse of the lung right you will observe that there is collapse of the lung and the other point is the presence of the hyperlucent lung field next is the trachea the trachea is being or the mediastinum or trachea is being shifted to the opposite side so these are the features chest x-ray features in patients with the pneumothorax and one more important sign that you need to remember is which has been asked as, uh, previous, uh, in the previous years about the deep sulcus sign now what exactly is the deep sulcus sign deep sulcus sign it is the insinuation of the air into the costophrenic angle when the patient when you take the chest x-ray in the supine position so you get this deep sulcus sign in a patient with the pneumothorax when you have taken the chest x-ray in a when a in the patient in the supine position right supine position that is what is called as the deep sulcus sign right next next is yes which of the following statement about pneumothorax is a true statement breath sounds are increased percussion note is decreased always needs chest tube insertion often needs chest tube insertion so this is a very very important point so what will happen to the breath sounds the breath sounds will be completely absent why because there is a collapsed lung so breath sounds are completely absent okay only in case of tension pneumothorax you get what is called amphoric breath sounds amphoric breath sounds are those which are having metallic quality sounds okay and you take this percussion note what will happen to the percussion note that will be increased there will be hyper resonant note there are two differential diagnoses where you can have hyper resonant note one is your pneumothorax and the other condition is the emphysema so these are the two conditions where you will have the hyper resonant note now the point is always needs chest tube insertion is a wrong statement see if the uh, volume of the pneumothorax or if the cvrt of the pneumothorax is very less right if the volume or the cvrt of the pneumothorax is very small then in such case we don't require to put or to place a chest tube insertion right so we place a chest tube insertion when there is significant pneumothorax causing collapse of the lung with sudden onset dyspnea you understand and when there is like very small amount of pneumothorax there is no collapse of the lung only just oxygen inhalation will suffice and will cause resolution of that pneumothorax so often needs chest tube insertion is correct statement but always needs chest tube insertion it is the wrong statement okay so these are some of the important points related to the pneumothorax now after having discussed about the pneumothorax the next important point of discussion is the respiratory failure now if you take this respiratory failure there are totally four types of respiratory failure what are these four types of respiratory failure that is nothing but your type 1 2 3 4 right type 1 2 3 4 now all of the following types of respiratory failure are correctly matched except the options are type 1 hypoxemic type 2 hypercapnic type 3 atelectatic type 4 perioperative right so which of the following is incorrectly paired hmm? which of the following is incorrectly paired right i can see some of the students answering asking the questions in the chat box right so you can just ask your doubts on my telegram channel directly immediately after the session right so explaining the doubts uh, definitely it will be a break for many other students who are attending the session so you can just type your uh, doubts in my telegram channel that is medicine made easy by dr rajesh guba 
definitely I'll answer your doubts. Okay, so let us have the fluency and as well as continuity of this session without having a uh, intermittent break of clearing the doubts. Okay, right. So all of the following are uh, types are correctly matched except so what is the uh, one which is incorrectly matched that is your type 4 respiratory failure. So type 4 respiratory failure it is the one which occurs secondary to cardiogenic shock right which occurs secondary to cardiogenic shock. Whereas you take type 1 respiratory failure, type 1 respiratory failure, it is acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. It is an acute hypoxemic respiratory failure and this occurs due to the fluid overload. Right, this occurs due to the fluid overload. Okay, now what could be the fluid overload condition either you take in case of pulmonary edema, either cardiogenic pulmonary edema or non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Next, early stages of bronchial asthma, right, early stages of bronchial asthma that is mild or moderate forms of bronchial asthma then even in patients with the chronic bronchitis you will have type 1 respiratory failure and what are the features in type 1 respiratory failure you will have hypoxia definitely and what about the carbon dioxide carbon dioxide levels they may be normal or the carbon dioxide levels may be reduced that is what you will observe in case of type 1 respiratory failure the other point is the a gradient so if you take arteriolar alveolar gradient of oxygen so, A gradient will be increased, that is what you will see in patients with type 1 respiratory failure and etiology just now we have discussed non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema that is ARDS or your cardiogenic pulmonary edema, mild to moderate bronchial asthma, then uh, your emphysema, not chronic bronchitis, I am very sorry, emphysema, emphysema will cause your type 1 respiratory failure. Now, you take your type 2 respiratory failure. So, if you take your type 2 respiratory failure, type 2 respiratory failure is due to failure of the gaseous exchange. Right, there is failure of the exchange of gases, right? Or it could be because of the hypoventilation, because of the hypoventilation, because of the problem within the respiratory centers. Now, what will be the parameters in the type 2 respiratory failure? So there will be hypoxia and then the hypercapnia, right? Hypoxia and as well as the hypercapnia. So this will be the points in type 2 respiratory failure. And in case of type 2 respiratory failure, what are all the etiologies that we can consider? The etiologies we can consider is the, uh, there are certain conditions which can cause suppress the respiratory centers like opioid intake can cause the suppression of the respiratory center. And second important endocrine disorder is hypothyroidism that can also cause the suppression of the respiratory center. So suppression of the respiratory centers can cause type 2 respiratory failure that is one thing. Second thing is the neuromuscular junction disorders right. So what are those neuromuscular junction disorders like myasthenia gravis? or the other conditions like glenn barry syndrome and as well as motor neuron disease where there can be paralysis of the respiratory muscles myasthenia gravis glenn barry syndrome motor neuron disease there is paralysis of the respiratory muscles causing your type 2 respiratory failure where there is hypoxia and as well as hypercapnia and the third condition is the myopathy right where there is pathology within the respiratory muscles itself like in case of muscular dystrophies or in electrolyte abnormalities like hypokalemia there can be development of type 2 respiratory failure. So you take any form of respiratory failure, the treatment is same. You need to treat the underlying cause. You need to supplement the oxygen with oxygen mask. And with the help of oxygen mask, if the saturation is not being maintained adequately, then you have to put the patient on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. And even non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, if it doesn't suffice, then you have to put the patient on mechanical ventilator with endotracheal tube. Right, so that is the common treatment in all the types of respiratory failure. But the only thing is, like you need to treat the underlying cause. And what exactly is the etiology of respiratory failure is different from one to one. Okay, then you take your type three respiratory failure. Type three respiratory failure, that is the post-operative respiratory failure, where there is lung atelectasis. That means even after the surgery, the individual is unable to recover back from the effect of general anesthesia. The individual is unable to recover back from the effect of the skeletal muscle relaxant. So the skeletal muscles like respiratory muscles, they are completely paralyzed. So once these respiratory muscles or skeletal muscles are completely paralyzed, what will happen is the lung, there will be collapse of the lung. There will be atelectasis of the lung. Okay, right. Then next is the period, sorry, your type 4. So type 4 is due to what? That is due to the cardiogenic shock. Hmm? That is due to cardiogenic shock. See, in case of your type 4 respiratory failure, what happens is whenever there is cardiogenic shock, there will be decrease in the respiratory muscle perfusion. Right? There will be decrease in the respiratory muscle perfusion. Now, see, respiratory muscles like your diaphragm, external intercostal muscles and internal intercostal muscles and you know how much of the cardiac output they take? 
See, they take less than 5% of the cardiac output. Which one? The respiratory muscles. Hmm? They take less than 5% of the cardiac output. But when there is cardiogenic shock because of hypotension, the respiratory muscle perfusion will be reduced and thereby, you know, the individual will land up in the respiratory failure. Okay. So, in your type 3 and type 4 also, the oxygen and carbon dioxide parameters will be similar to that of type 2. That is, they will have hypoxia and as well as the hypercapnia. Right. So, these are the types of the respiratory failure. Type 1, type 2, type 3. So, type 1, it is acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. Type 2, hypercapnic respiratory failure. Type 3, perioperative or atelectatic lung. Type 4, it is due to hypoperfusion of respiratory muscles due to cardiogenic shock. Right. So, we are done with the topic related to the respiratory failure. Right. Now, you see this question. In ICU setting, patients suffering from which of the following respiratory pathology is most predisposed for carbon dioxide narcosis? Carbon dioxide narcosis means what? It should be type 2 respiratory failure. The options are motor neuron disease, asthma, emphysema and then bronchiectasis. So, motor neuron disease is the one which is associated with the development of type 2 respiratory failure. Whereas, you take the remaining three conditions, asthma, emphysema, bronchiectasis, they cause type 1 respiratory failure where the carbon dioxide levels may be normal or may be decreased because of carbon dioxide washout. Okay. Whereas, only in which form of asthma you can have carbon dioxide narcosis, that is in acute severe asthma, that is in case of status asthmaticus. In case of status asthmaticus, you know, there can be hypercapnia, but not in case of mild to moderate form of asthma, right? Now, so that was about your uh, topic related to the respiratory failure. Next, yes. Now, we will take up the next important condition. So, what exactly is the chest x-ray finding? What is your diagnosis? So, what is that you are seeing? You are observing or it is very clear that one lobe of the lung, right? One lobe of the lung, you are having the presence of obesity, opacity. And this particular patient present with a high-grade fever. So, this is suggestive of lobar pneumonia. Right? This is suggestive of lobar pneumonia. So, in case of lobar pneumonia, right? you will have the entire lobe of the lung which is being consolidated right the entire lobe of the lung is being consolidated okay and the next important the next important is you should know what is the most common organism that will be causing lobar pneumonia the answer will be the strep pneumonia right the answer will be the strep pneumonia that will be causing the lobar pneumonia, right? And in these patients with lobar pneumonia, if you see the examination findings, right, the trachea will be central. There will be no shift of the trachea in case of your lobar pneumonia, but the vocal resonance and as well as the vocal phrematis that will be increased in case of the lobar pneumonia, right? Because it's a consolidated lung. And what will be the percussion note? The percussion note will be the presence of the woody dull note. Right, the percussion note will be the presence of the woody dull note. Okay, that will be the percussion note. And auscultation is very, very important in case of the lobar pneumonia or consolidation. So, the auscultation will be the presence of bronchial breath sounds. Right, the presence of bronchial breath sounds. So, if you see this bronchial breath sounds, what type of bronchial breath sounds you will have in consolidation? That is tubular type of bronchial breath sounds. Where the individual will have hollow aspirating quality. The individual will have hollow aspirating quality. That is what is the type of breath sounds you will have in case of the consolidated lung. Now, you have other types of bronchial breath sounds like cavernous type of breath sound. Cavernous type of bronchial breath sounds you come across when the individual is having the presence of cavity within the lung. Right? And next is the amphoric breath sounds. Amphoric breath sound just now we have discussed that is seen in case of tension pneumothorax where the individual will have, you know, the metallic quality. Okay. So, that is about your respiratory sounds. Now, yes, you take the another form of pneumonia. See, what are the chest x-ray finding and what is the diagnosis? See, here what is that you are finding is, you are finding that there is presence of opacities and these opacities are like patchy. They are not like confined to one lobe. And this is what you see in case of bronchopneumonia. So, in bronchopneumonia, you will observe the patchy opacities and you will notice that the 
bronchus is also being affected in lobar pneumonia the bronchus is not involved but whereas in bronco pneumonia even the bronchus is also being affected right and you the chest x ray will show you the presence of the patchy opacities and the organism that can cause your bronco pneumonia will be staph whereas your lobar pneumonia you have strep and you have klebsiella which will be causing lobar pneumonia and next is what are the chest x ray finding and what is the diagnosis in this scenario see if you take the chest x ray here what is that pattern we call it as we call this as the interstitial pattern right we call this as the interstitial pattern right so this we call it where there is lacy pattern all over the lung and these interstitial pneumonia what are the organisms it is mainly the viral infections apart from that you also have some bacteria that is mlc what is mlc it is not member of legislative council m is your mycoplasma l is your legionella c is your chlamydia so these are the bacterial organisms which can cause the interstitial pneumonia and not only that even your viral infections right adenovirus influenza your covid 19 they will be causing your interstitial pneumonia and these patients with interstitial pneumonia they don't have the cough with expectoration these patients they'll have the dry cough and some important points you need to know is about the legionella see legionella not only pulmonary manifestations these individuals will also have extra pulmonary manifestations and that will be in the form of diarrhea and that will cause the development of hyponatremia and because of hyponatremia the patient can have the altered sensorium and as well as the seizures okay now whereas you take chlamydia this is very common this uh, we have a species called chlamydia psittacosis this is very common in those individuals who are like bird handlers so in case of bird handlers the organism is mainly the chlamydia psittacosis or uh, chlamydia psittaci and the pneumonia we call it as the psittacosis right the pneumonia we call it as psittacosis okay next then the another pneumonia that you need to remember is yes you see this what are the chest x ray findings and what is the diagnosis see this classical appearance of the x ray whatever is there we call it as the ground glass opacity now where is that which organism will cause the ground glass opacity that will be pneumocystis gerbaceae pneumonia which is very common in immunocompromised patients right very common in immunocompromised patients and what will be the investigation of choice in these patients and okay what are the manif clinical manifestations these patients with tcp pneumonia or pneumocystis gerbaceae pneumonia they'll have dry cough and exertional dyspnea will be there dry cough exertional dyspnea and abg will show you the presence of the hypoxemia but what is the investigation of choice is the bronchoalveolar lavage and examination right you need to do bronchoscopy and you have to take the bronchoalveolar lavage and you have to do the examination of the organism okay and the stain what we use is methylamine silver stain in order to pick up that organism okay right and what is the drug of choice for pcp pneumonia drug of choice will be trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole this will be the drug of choice right trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole okay so these are the important forms of pneumonia that you need to know lobar pneumonia then bronco pneumonia interstitial pneumonia and as well as the uh, pneumonia caused by your pcp where you have the presence of ground glass opacities on the chest x ray next then you see the next important topic that is the tuberculosis so if you see the tuberculosis what are the various methods of transmission of tuberculosis one is by droplet right droplet transmission second ingestion third vertical transmission fourth direct contact right fourth direct contact now you take this droplet transmission see tuberculosis transmission via droplets affects the lungs and as well as the tonsils right lungs and as well as the tonsils now seeding of this tuberculous organism in the tonsils will lead to what is called as cervical lymphadenopathy right and this cervical lymphadenopathy this will be the most common form of the extra pulmonary tuberculosis right and what is the best method by which you can diagnose this tuberculous lymphadenitis that is by fnac fnac will show you the presence of the caseating granuloma so if the question is asked like what is the most common site for extra pulmonary tuberculosis the answer should be cervical lymphadenopathy and next to cervical lymphadenopathy there can be involvement of pleura and there can be even genito urinary tuberculosis and the other methods of transmission of your tuberculous organism is by ingestion where the individual will develop ileocecal tuberculosis right where the individual will develop ileocecal tuberculosis and why that is swallowing of mycobacterium tuberculosis that can lead to the ileocecal tuberculosis okay vertical transmission that is from mother to fetus that is what is your transplacental spread or vertical transmission 
So here in vertical transmission, where is that Gons focus formed in the fetus? The Gons focus in the fetus, it is formed in the liver. Right, Gons focus, it is formed in the liver of the baby during the intrauterine life and the direct contact. See, the direct contact tuberculosis, that is through skin, skin contact and <coughs> so this we call it as the lupus vulgaris which is nothing but your skin tuberculosis, right, which is nothing but skin tuberculosis. Now, once the organism has entered into the lung, what will be the most common site of Gons focus in primary and in secondary? The most common site of Gons focus in primary tuberculosis that will be, right, that will be lower border of the upper lobe, right, that will be the lower border of the upper lobe, whereas you take in case of the secondary tuberculosis, in secondary tuberculosis, the Gons focus is most commonly seen at the apex of the lung, right, commonly seen at the apex of, primary tuberculosis is means the individual is exposed to the organism for the first time. Secondary tuberculosis means where the organism which was already there, which has been activated. That is what is your secondary tuberculosis. Now, very important questions in tuberculosis that will be asked is the names of these lesions. So, this organism will not just stay within the lung. It spreads to the various parts of the body, right? That is your disseminated. And they form or this tuberculosis form the lesions in different parts of the body. And accordingly, the names have been given. So, you take the pulse lesion. What is the pulse lesion where the presence of the Gons focus in the supraclavicular area, right, supraclavicular focus, right, supraclavicular focus in chronic pulmonary tuberculosis is called as the pulse lesion. Next is the Asman focus. What is Asman focus? You have the presence of lesion in the infraclavicular area. So, infraclavicular focus in chronic pulmonary tuberculosis is your Asman focus. Then Vigert focus. What is Vigert focus? The presence of caseating metastatic focus in the pulmonary vein. Okay. So V for Vigert, V for vein. Just remember that. Simon focus. Simon focus, it is a calcified focus, right? It is a calcified focus at the apex of the lung. That will be Simon focus. Rich focus, that is the focus in the uh, brain, that is tubercular meningitis. That will be the rich focus. Next is Simons. Simon is calcified focus at the apex of the lung. Simons is the tuberculous foci in the liver. Lastly, the Ponset's disease. That we call it, that is nothing but the tuberculous arthritis. Okay. So, these are the various lesions. Now, in case of disseminated tuberculosis, what is that you have to remember is, why is it, the another name for it is, it is also called as the miliary tuberculosis. It is also called as the miliary tuberculosis. Now, why is it called miliary tuberculosis? Because the, if you take the lesions or the opacities within the lung, the lesions or opacities in the lung are of the size of the millet seeds, right? Are of the size of the millet seeds. That is the reason why it is called the miliary tuberculosis. And in case of disseminated tuberculosis, the organism doesn't stay much in the lung. It spreads to the distant organs. So that is the reason why even if you do a sputum examination, there is high chance that the sputum examination may come negative. And the another description of this chest x-ray is it is also called the snowstorm appearance. Now, what are the other conditions where you can have the snowstorm appearance? One is definitely tuberculosis. The other condition where you can have the snowstorm appearance is you come across this in case of the silicosis, you come across this in the hemosiderosis, right? And other conditions are the varicella zoster pneumonia, that is the chicken pox, and then pulmonary alveolar proteinosis. These are all the conditions where you can have the presence of the snowstorm appearance. Now, if you take the investigations apart from the chest x ray, the other important test is the tuberculin test. So, in order to tell the tuberculin test to be positive, how much should be the uh, size of the induration? It should be more than 10 mm. But what are the clinical conditions? This is one of the PYQ. What are the clinical conditions? Even the size of induration is like 6 to 10 mm also, we consider it as positive. Usually it is more than 10 mm, we consider it as positive. But even 6 to 10 mm is positive in conditions like the HIV. Okay. And in patients who are having close contact with tuberculous patient. And the patient who is on immunocompromised treatment or immunosuppressive treatment, the patient who is on steroids, the patient who is on chemotherapeutic drugs. So, patient who is on immunosuppressive treatment also, 
So even if 6 to 10 mm in duration is there, we consider it to be positive. And so these are the conditions where even 6 to 10 mm of in duration we consider as positive. Next is the investigation of choice in case of tuberculosis. The investigation of choice in tuberculosis will be the CBNAT. What do you understand by the word CBNAT? That is cartridge based nucleic acid amplification test. So you take the CBNAT, you will get this result within 2 to 4 hours. And the advantage of this particular CBNAT, which is also called gene expert, is it will also tell you about the multidrug resistance. That means, is the tuberculous organism resistant to isoniazid and rifampicin or not? Even that can also be said by your CBNAT. And next is, what exactly you mean by multidrug resistant tuberculosis is defined as resistance to isoniazid and as well as rifampicin. N not only MDR-TB, we have another form of TB. Okay. Now, in order to have the development of MDR-TB, there should be development of gene mutation. Now, for development of rifampicin resistance, the gene which is being mutated in the organism is RPOB gene. And in order to develop pyrazinamide resistance for the tuberculous organism, the gene that has to be mutated is the PNCA gene. And for the development of INH resistance, the gene that is to be mutated is the INH A gene. So these are the gene mutations which are responsible for the development of the resistance of uh, rifampicin, isoniazid and as well as pyrazinamide in the tuberculous organism, right? Next. Next is, yes, we have, yeah, apart from this, we have another terminology called XDRTB, that is extended drug resistant tuberculosis. So extended drug resistant tuberculosis means the organism is resistant to the isoniazid, the organism is resistant to rifampicin and along with this, the organism is also resistant to the second line anti tubercular drug. The organism is resistant either to capriomycin or the canamycin and then amikacin. Right and then amikacin. So this is what is called as the XDR tuberculosis, extended drug resistant tuberculosis. Right now, next another important uh, investigation is the sputum examination. So in the sputum examination, you have to use certain stains for eliciting the tuberculous bacilli. And what are those stains? One is the carbalfoxin stain, which is the nothing but the classical zeal Nielsen stain, and the other one is the fluorochrome stain, that is nothing but your ormine rhodamine, and as well as the or the ormine stain. So these are the two stains that can be used to demonstrate the acid fast bacilli. Okay, next. What is the treatment, right? Everyone is aware of the first line anti-tubercular drugs and second line anti-tubercular drugs and even the regimen. But what is that very important you need to remember here is the new drugs. What are the new drugs for the treatment of the tuberculosis? The new drugs are the pre right? Then we have bidaquiline, right? We have the bidaquiline. Next is dilaminate. Okay, so these are the new drugs for the treatment of the tuberculosis. So these are some of the important points related to your mycobacterium tuberculosis. Now after this, we'll move on to the discussion of some fungal infections of the lung. That is your aspergillosis. So aspergillus, remember, we have two important species. One is aspergillus fumigatus, the other one is aspergillus niger. The aspergillus fumigatus is the one which will be causing the pulmonary aspergillosis. Whereas if you take the pulp, aspergillus niger, that is associated with external ear infection, that is the fungal otitis media. And this is very commonly, this aspergillus infection is very commonly seen in severely immunocompromised patients, right? Severely immunocompromised patients. And particularly if you take this ABPA, so we have four forms of aspergillosis, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, saprophytic aspergillosis, which is also called aspergilloma, chronic necrotizing aspergillosis and invasive aspergillosis. Now, out of this, if you take this ABPA, that is allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, it is a hypersensitivity reaction, right? P allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, it is a pulmonary hypersensitivity disorder, which is caused by allergy to the fungal antigen that colonizes in the tracheobronchial tree. That is what is your ABPA, right? What is it? It is a pulmonary hypersensitivity reaction. Okay. Now, this... Uh, ABPA, it is very commonly seen in the individuals suffering with asthma. These patients, they have the pulmonary infiltrates upon the chest x-ray. And when you check the eosinophil levels, you have the peripheral eosinophilia. And the immediate skin sensitivity test for aspergillus antigen will be positive. 
there will be elevated serum IgE levels, right? There will be elevated serum IgE levels and there will be proximal or central bronchiectasis. So, these are the main diagnostic criteria. Now, what are the secondary diagnostic criteria? The secondary diagnostic criteria is the sputum. The color of the sputum will be brownish plugs in the sputum. And second is the identification or culture of the aspergillus fumigatus from the sputum and elevated IgE antibodies specific for the aspergillus fumigatus. So, these are the secondary diagnostic criteria, right? Now, now after having discussed about the criteria, like what will be the clinical presentation? Just now we have discussed cough with expectoration and peripheral blood will show you eustochia and as well as elevated IgE levels. Now, yes, you see this question. All of the following are true about bronchopulmonary aspergillosis except central bronchic cases, pleural effusion, asthma, then the eusnophilia. See, you have to remember a very important point that in case of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, you don't have the development of the pleural effusion, whereas central or proximal bronchic cases can be there, asthma can be seen and even development of the eusnophilia, right? And yes. And what is the drug of choice for your allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis? The drug of, see, it is the immune hypersensitivity reaction. So, the drugs that we can be given is the steroids. Right, that will suppress the immune hypersensitivity. Okay, so that is your steroids. Next, next is you see the other question. A 40 year old patient with history of prolonged, sorry, history of prolonged shortness of breath. Test X ray shows the presence of diffuse pulmonary infiltrates. Skin hypersensitivity is positive for, right, it is positive for the aspergillus antigen. The peripheral blood shows the normal eusnophilia and serum Ig levels, they are normal. What do you think is the most likely diagnosis? Allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, ABPA, extrinsic allergic alveolitis, invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. See, here the very important point is the Ig levels, right? The very important point is Ig levels. So, if you take the hypersensitivity reaction to the aspergillus, hypersensitivity reactions to the aspergillus, we divide it into two forms. One is IgE mediated and the other one is non-IgE mediated. See, IgE mediated is that you come across this in individuals with having pre-existing asthma, that to atopic asthma or IgE levels elevated in case of aspergillus means it will be allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. But in a scenario where the aspergillus antigen is positive but IgE levels are normal, that will be your extrinsic allergic alveolitis. So, what exactly is this now? Here it is the extrinsic allergic alveolitis. Why? Because the serum Ig levels are normal. The peripheral blood eusnophils are normal. So, that is suggestive of the extrinsic allergic alveolitis, right? Now, so this and what are all the points in case of extrinsic allergic alveolitis? Remember, they will have the normal Ig levels, right? They will have the normal Ig levels and you take the peripheral blood eusnophilia. No. So, eusnophil levels in the peripheral blood will be absolutely normal and chest x-ray, you have the diffuse pulmonary infiltrates on the chest x-ray. So, this is about your extrinsic allergic alveolitis. Now, you take an ABPA, one, see what are the various methods by which you can diagnose your allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. One is your peripheral blood eusnophilia and serum IgE levels are elevated and serum uh, precipitins or antigens for aspergillus fumigatus will be there. But you need to know the X-ray in these patients with the allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. So, if you take the X-ray in these individuals, you have the presence of bronchiectasis, right? And where is that you have the bronchiectasis predominantly? That is the central bronchiectasis or the opacities are mainly confined to the upper lobe. The opacities are mainly confined to the upper lobe. But these opacities, they don't just remain only in the upper lobe. These shadows, they move around the upper part of the lung. Right? They remain within the upper lobe or upper part, but they move around the upper part of the lung. And that particular type of opacities, we call it as the fleeting opacities. Right? We call it as the fleeting opacities. That is what is the chest x-ray finding in patients with the allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Now, what exactly is the drug of choice for allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis? That is the corticosteroid therapy. That is prednisolone is the drug of choice for allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. Okay, right. Right, now we'll move on to the next topic that is tropical pulmonary eusnophilia. Right, so I'm, I'm very sorry that I'm not going uh, with your comments like whatever you are typing. 
so i have already said you like if you have any doubts please text me on my telegram channel that is medicine made easy by dr rajesh guba where i'll answer you there right so this will be a break if i want to give any explanation or if i want to clear any doubt for you okay right so now the next topic is the tropical pulmonary eosinophilia so tropical pulmonary eosinophilia you see this important question all of the following diseases are associated with peripheral blood eosinophilia except right all of the following diseases are, uh, features are associated or the features of tropical pulmonary eosinophilia except that is which is the incorrect statement related to the tropical pulmonary eosinophilia see in case of tropical pulmonary eosinophilia what you have to remember is that this tropical pulmonary eosinophilia it is a distinct syndrome that develops in individuals infected with lymphatic filarial species right infected with lymphatic filarial species and this tropical pulmonary eosinophilia it is more common in males rather than females right and these patients that is males who develop this tropical pulmonary eosinophilia they have history of uh, history of the uh, their presence in filarial endemic region right they have come from the uh, area where there is the filarial endemic region and what will be the clinical manifestation in these individuals is the presence of the paroxysmal cough and wheezing and this cough and wheezing usually it is nocturnal right usually it is nocturnal and what are the other features in these individuals with tropical pulmonary eosinophilia weight loss will be there low grade fever and as well as the adenopathy and what about the eosinophil levels the eosinophil levels in tropical pulmonary eosinophilia will be more than 3000 cells per cubic millimeter next thing is the chest x ray so if you take the chest x ray the chest x ray will show the presence of the bron increased bronchovascular markings and there will be diffuse miliary lesions and there will be also mottled opacities right bronchovascular mark prominent bronchovascular markings will be there diffuse miliary lesions and there will be mottled opacities that will be the chest x ray finding now do you see microfilaria in the blood the answer is no right you don't see the microfilaria within the blood what is that you will see in the uh, peripheral blood is you have the ige antibody that is anti filarial antibody right that is the anti filarial antibody and when you do a pulmonary function test also pulmonary function test in case of the tropical pulmonary eosinophilia which is being caused by infection with lymphatic filariasis that will show you the presence of the restrictive pattern where your fev1 by fvc is more than or equal to 70% right so the diagnosis of your tropical pulmonary eosinophilia is confirmed by marked elevation of the filarial antibody it is not the microfilaria in the blood so microfilaria are generally not detectable in the peripheral blood right not detectable in the peripheral blood okay right so and what exactly is your drug of choice your uh, for your tropical pulmonary eosinophilia that is your diethyl carbamazepine so this diethyl carbamazepine what is the standard dose the standard dose for diethyl carbamazepine is 6 mg per kg body weight and so you have to give in three doses you have to give in three doses and you have to give it for 12 to 21 days okay so diethyl carbamazepine is active against microfilaria and as well as even the adult worms so that is about your tropical pulmonary eosinophilia which is being caused by what it is caused by infect it is caused by individuals infected with lymphatic filarial species okay right the next important part of the discussion will be the pulmonary function test so even though uh, these are being dealt in detail in the physiology but what i'll show you here is some of the image based questions on the uh, pulmonary function test so what are what is that instrument with which uh, we measure the pulmonary function test that is the spirometer right spirometer is the one which we measure the pulmonary function test but the spirometer cannot measure certain lung functions what are those the spirometer cannot measure the residual volume spirometer cannot measure the total lung capacity and this spirometer can also can also not measure the functional residual capacity so these are the volumes and capacities that cannot be measured by your spirometer right now in order to measure this residual volume total lung capacity or the functional residual capacity what you require is the body plethysmography right what you require is body plethysmography okay so this is the best test for 
assessing the residual volume, the total lung capacity and as well as the functional residual capacity as well, right? Now, what is important is, what is the purpose of your pulmonary function test? That is mainly to differentiate obstructive lung diseases from the restrictive lung diseases. That is the important function of your pulmonary function test. And in case of the obstructive lung diseases, how will be the pulmonary functions? And in restrictive lung diseases, what will be the pulmonary functions? So all that, let me just try to show you quickly. So, right, you take in case of the obstructive lung diseases. What are all your obstructive lung diseases? Asthma, bronchiectasis, bronchitis, cystic fibrosis and COPD. These are all your OLD, obstructive lung diseases. And remember, in case of the obstructive lung diseases, almost all the volumes, right, almost all the volumes, they are increased. Okay, that means what I mean to say is the capacities. Okay, so total lung capacity increases, residual volume increases, functional residual capacity also increases. Except for this, very, very important to diagnose that it is an OLD is this one, that is FEV1 by FVC. So, FEV1 by FVC, it is decreased. How much it is decreased? It is decreased to as low as 20 to 30 percent. Normal value is 70 percent. Right? And other parameters are the peak expiratory flow rate is also being reduced. Okay. Next. Next is the DLCO, diffusion capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide. Diffusion capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide is normal in all the forms of obstructive lung diseases except for your emphysema. In emphysema, the DLCO will be decreased. So, this is about the story of PFT in OLD. Now, you take the restrictive lung diseases. See, what are all the examples of your restrictive lung diseases? You have pulmonary and as well as the extra pulmonary conditions. So, what are the pulmonary pathologies that will cause the restrictive lung diseases? That includes sarcoidosis, pneumoconiosis, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and as well as drug or radiation induced interstitial lung diseases. And you also have some extra pulmonary conditions. What are those extra pulmonary conditions like diaphragmatic palsy, Glenn-Barry syndrome, muscular dystrophy where there will be respiratory muscle paralysis, cervical spine injury and even chest abnormalities like kyphoscoliosis, obesity, ankylosing spondylitis. These are all the conditions where you will have the restrictive lung diseases. And in restrictive lung diseases, let me tell you, like most of the parameters, they are decreased except for your FEV1 by FVC. FEV1 by FVC, it remains normal or increased. Whereas you take all other parameters, they are decreased in patients with the restrictive lung diseases, right? So let me just show you the uh, flow volume loops. So in the flow volume loop, this is a normal flow volume loop. So, in the flow volume loop, that what you need to know is, you have the loop below the exact, below the uh, y-axis, okay, yeah, sorry, below the x-axis and above the x-axis. So, above the, sorry, below the x-axis, that will be the inspiratory component and above the, that is the positive side, that will be the expiratory pattern, okay. Now, you can just remember easily, whenever we are inhaling, the air moves down. So, that will be the inspiratory loop lower down. And whenever we exhale, the air moves out. That is exhalation, expiration. So, the expiratory volume loop will be above. Okay. Now, this is a normal flow volume loop. Now, how will be the flow volume loop in case of the different pathologies? Like you see, this particular flow volume loop. The pattern shown on the flow volume loop is. So, now, what has been reduced here, it is the expiration which has been reduced. Expiration is classically reduced in case of the obstructive lung diseases. Like in OLD, like you take in patients with asthma, bronchitis, bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, COPD, you get this particular type of the flow volume loop where the expiratory component is being reduced. Okay. And the next important is, okay, you see this, the flow volume, uh, flow volume loop. Right, so where only the inspiratory component is reduced, but expiration is normal. You take in case of the restrictive lung diseases, in restrictive lung diseases, both of them are reduced. Inspiration, expiration, both are reduced. But in which scenario you get only the inspiration being reduced? You get this in case of the variable extra thoracic obstruction. Like, for example, the presence of a retrosternal goiter. So, this particular retrosternal goiter, it is an obstructive lesion. So, this lesion, this retrosternal goiter, it is being sucked inwards or sucked down when the individual is inhaling. So, when the retrosternal goiter is sucked down, when the individual is inhaling, the goiter can compress the airway, thereby the inspiration can be reduced. And whenever the individual exhales, the, uh, this particular retrosternal goiter moves up and the expiration will be normal. So, variable extrathoracic obstruction, you will observe that there is only decrease in your expiration. 
but whereas you see another important flow volume loop i'm sorry one sec yeah so only inspiration be being reduced is in case of variable extrathoracic obstruction okay now you see the another important uh, flow volume loop so in this flow volume loop what is that you are observing you are observing that only expiration is being reduced right expiration is being reduced but inspiration is being normal so you come across this in case of variable intrathoracic goiter right variable intrathoracic goiter you will have the only the expiration being reduced and what is that uh, intrathoracic goiter that is the laryngeal tumor so laryngeal tumor that will be a variable intrathoracic goiter where only the expiration will be reduced but the inspiration will remain normal now the another condition is the scenario where right the scenario where both expiration and as well as the inspiration will be reduced so you come across this in case of the fixed obstruction of the trachea what is that fixed obstruction of the trachea that is in case of the tracheal stenosis right in case of the tracheal stenosis so in case of tracheal stenosis where there is fixed airway obstruction both inspiration and as well as the expiration is being reduced okay so this is about yeah so this is about the all the topics which have been done in the pulmonology so i did not leave any particular topic in the pulmonology so almost all the topics are being done quickly in the topic of pulmonology right so once we are done with this we will move on to okay now i i have a clinical scenario right which is there in your uh, uh, booklet i mean the pdf which has been sent uh, let us try to crack this uh, clinical scenario okay right so the question is a six, lengthy question you have to you should have little patience while reading this question right and yes the basic rule is same whenever you